Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is musician, poet, artist, and author Ian Morris. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. You know, every now and then, I get the great pleasure of meeting a soul so powerful, so beautiful, so inspiring and uplifting. I feel blessed to have moments in time with them, and even more blessed to be able to share such a magnificent soul with each of you. Today, you get to enjoy a deep, amazing conversation with Ian Morris, an incredible musician, music producer, and founder of ListeningToSmile.com. Our topic today is music that heals you. In this podcast today, you will get to experience Ian's amazing healing music, and our topic today is music that heals you. Ian shares his incredible journey from being overweight at about 350 pounds and having serious challenges with cancer. He was getting worse with the standard medical approaches and decided he must take his health into his own hands, which many have learned is a very wise thing to do. He was trained by a musician as his father, and he can play 28 musical instruments. He started studying and practicing holistic health and creating music with the intention of healing himself. And not only did he heal himself, he lost the extra weight and got himself in sound physical health. I really loved our dialogue because Ian really danced with me as we got deep into the guts of science and vibration and music and how specifically music can be used to heal and why it works. Ian shares cases of people with diseases that healed by using his healing music. In fact, in my research on Ian, to prepare for the podcast, I was quite wound up, literally wound up, because as I was writing the outline and doing my research, I looked up at the sound of multiple airplanes buzzing. I thought there was an air show going on, only to see a massive amount of smoke right outside of our home. And I ran outside to look, and there was a massive 110-acre fire only one mile from me, which out here in Southern California means bad news. I sprinted to the highest point on our property and I could see six fire bomber planes and two fire bomber helicopters going full speed to put this fire out. But naturally, being in hot, dry San Diego, a fire that close can mean the end of a home and property that you love. When I finally saw that the fire was being effectively managed by our amazing California firefighters, I went back to my work and found Ian's trauma healing and anxiety healing music tracks on his website. And within just one minute of listening to his trauma healing music, I could feel my intestines unwinding and my whole body calming. I was truly impressed at the effectiveness of his healing music. Ian explains the science and his incredibly beautiful spiritual practices that go into his healing music in this podcast, and it's very impressive indeed. Ian also has an incredible subscription program for his healing music, an affiliate sales program so you can earn money helping people heal with healing music, and a beautiful training program you can enter to learn to apply his incredible library of healing music to your clients' healing processes or to become a healing music therapist. I was so impressed with Ian Morris that as soon as I got done with our podcast, I introduced him to two of my best friends that are musician healers, and we are all interested in working with Ian to create more healing music to help the world heal now. I absolutely love this guy, and I'm confident you will too. Get ready to be truly inspired by a man that turned his pain into healing for the world. Enjoy Music That Heals You with the one and only Ian Morris. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have possibly one of the most important podcasts I've ever done with an amazing man named Ian Morris, who is multi-talented, but an incredible musician that makes music that heals you. 
which is the title of our podcast today. Ian, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, me too. You know, I've listened to some of your music on your website, and I was super impressed. I, I was, uh, as I was sharing with you off, off, offline here, as I was writing your, your outline for our podcast today, there was a huge fire a mile from our house. And so I'm all buzzed out and stressed out and thinking, holy Christ, we might be losing our house any minute now. And there was like six air bombers going at it and multiple helicopters just tag teaming this thing. And my neighbor, who's a little higher than me, was on his patio watching it and watching it <laughs> grow to it was a 110 acre fire. And it, it was surrounding lots of houses. It was very, very scary. And then I've got all this stress from what's going on in the world in me. And I've been, you know, meditating and breathing and asking my soul for guidance. But, you know, when you're open, like guys like you and I are, you can feel the collective unconscious working through you. And it's like I can feel the fear in everybody, you know? Yeah. So I was on your website and I thought, let me check out Ian's music and get a sample of it. And I ended up on your page with healing music. And the first one I saw on the top left was healing trauma. So, well, that's a good place to start. And I'll tell you what, within 20 seconds of listening to that, it felt like my small intestine was unwinding, like my breathing was improving. And it was just like someone was lifting a weight right off me. And I immediately knew this guy's the real deal. Then I listened to your anxiety track and found it just as powerful and, and just let your music play for about an hour while I wrote this outline, which I ended up having to do on battery power because the fire department shut our power off. I'm super excited to talk about all the things we're going to go through today. What, excuse me, one of the things that I found most interesting, I watched all the videos on your site, is you have quite a story. And, you know, before we get into that, I tell people, Oftentimes, the real shaman of the world come through very challenging pathways from getting struck by lightning to bit by poisonous stakes to having very painful, challenging upbringings as children to having to work through disease processes. And when I heard your story and was listening to your music, I thought, this guy has been initiated by great spirit. He's been to hell and he knows how to help people back to, to the light. So. I'd love it if you could give us all an overview of, of, of your story and what ultimately led to you using music to heal and then sharing that with the rest of the world. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for that, man. Um, yeah. So I think to start the story, you really have to focus on dyslexia because of how different the dyslexic brain uh, operates, you know, it's a different structure, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, in school I had a, a really hard time, uh, kind of in the traditional models of learning. Uh, and in that there was a lot of bullying and, uh, getting made fun of, and I felt very alienated, you know, at a young age. Um, and that alienation, uh, changes your brain. You know, you're you're not part of the group. Uh, you're on the outside, and so, in many ways, in that time period, you feel cursed. You feel lost and alone. But as you mature and get older, you realize it was a blessing. You know, it was a blessing because it changed your framing of society. It changed your perspective of reality. It changes what uh, limitations. Uh, it changes the possibilities. You know, so that really is the beginning you know, of the story of just coming out, uh, you know, into a different reality from most of my family, from most of my friends, uh, just being a little, a little different, you know? Um, but, uh, my dad was a musician. He, you know, played a lot of instruments. He was very talented and I was just lucky that I got that music in my blood for sure. You know, you I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I play about 25 different instruments and a lot of that I attribute to my father um, and the blessing of that gift. And, you know, I'm a painter, a visual artist, and I'm also a poet. And I would say probably my poetry is probably my strong point. But, you know, that's poetry amazing. Is, yeah. Well, those poetry. all go together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. And so uh, what I'm getting at is basically I've learned that these are tools of engagement, that really the work that we're doing is engaging people. 
and that these creative outlets are really tools of engagement for people. And so um, just really, really blessed to, to be a part of that. But where the shift from just doing entertainment based music to, you know, release work and healing music um, was when, you know, 2010, 2011, I was uh, starting to become ill and then ultimately got diagnosed with MS and colon cancer. <clears throat> and I was a musician that did not have health insurance, uh, racked up like almost $60,000 of doctor bills. Wow. Um, That's easy it to was, do. Yeah, it really is. I remember one of the uh, tests they did was they shot me full of dye, radioactive dye, and put me in the scanner. And I remember two weeks later, I got a bill it was like almost $4,000 just for that one test, you know, and uh, I was just like blown away. Couldn't I couldn't believe it. Uh, so, yeah, so basically... Uh, I found myself kind of alone and hopeless in that moment again, you know, where I felt very overwhelmed and um, I happened to realize I couldn't afford the treatments uh, or uh, really agreed with what they were wanting to do. And I ultimately didn't really know what my options were, uh, you know, moving forward with that. And so I happened to go home and I found uh, The Healing Power of Sound by Dr. Mitchell Gaynor. And simultaneously, my mother had given me the book, um, uh, Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. Great and, book. Yes, amazing books. And both of those books I was reading simultaneously just because of mm, uh, desperation, really. You know, just saying, well, I've tried everything else. Let's see if these books have anything to offer. And I just went down the rabbit hole, you know, with both of the books, I started really trying to change my, my framing and perspective and being a musician, I started listening to binaural beats and said, well, what does this have to offer? And, uh, you know, about 20 minutes in, I knew that this was something that was really resonating with me. Uh, and the more I've worked with it for a few months, I said, man, I really love these frequencies, but I do not like this music that is being associated with this. It seems real cliche cookie cutter. You know, I wanted something that went deeper. And so, um, yeah, so I started experimenting with sound and that was it. I mean, once I started really changing the focus of my music from entertainment based music to, uh, you know, working on myself, I started seeing massive improvements in myself. And I think it was both, it was the music and the frequencies but it was also the creative outputs and the experimentation creatively was helping me to release, you know, uh, a lot of the stagnant energy that was in my body. But I saw things improve with my dyslexia. I start. I was 315 pounds when I got diagnosed. I was extremely overweight. Um, and that was from touring and from, you know, just living fast food lifestyle, you know, being on the road all the time. Um, and just being depressed, you know? And so, so I started seeing changes in my mental health, changes in my perspective, my uh, mindset. I started seeing weight loss. I started seeing dyslexia it was becoming a thing of the past. You know, the, I was rewiring my brain, creating new neuro pathways and new, uh, blocks, uh, building blocks that I was building on, uh, with these frequencies. And it just really helped to kind of re a makeover for my complete mind and body, you know, what a blessing. And, and what an amazing, uh, it's such a great example of if we let go, if we let go of what doctors are saying, we let go of, of the, the standard fear-based model. And we do what your life being isolated and bullied taught you to do, which was develop a deeper relationship with ourselves. We find the mystery and the magic of love and healing within ourselves. And isn't it amazing how your own pain has now become such an amazing gift to the whole world? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I think is awesome about <clears throat> um, art and music and poetry is that they teach you to see the surroundings <clears throat> you know, the, let me get a drink of water here. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'll have to, I'll email you some of my paintings. We can share some paintings together because uh, you and I share a lot of things in common. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, but I think like what all of those things do is they teach you to look, um, 
at these, like a metaphor or, you know, the external environment. And they're teaching you like there's parts of you that are existing in connection resonance with these things in the outer. And I think it's what God did in creating the universe, you know, as above, so below, you know, within, without. Um, it's, it's a whole thing that when we see these things and we connect with these things externally, that it's a reminder to turn in, you know, to see, to recognize the same exact beautiful thing, uh, on the inside that you hold it as well, you know? And I just think that's such a cool commentary from art, you know, it's, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, because you're dealing with frequency, color is frequency and, and so is shape. Right. When we create a face or a hand or the onk or the cross or a circle or a square or a star, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all frequencies. And I, I would imagine you're familiar with sonic geometry. Yes. Yeah. So once you understand sonic geometry, you can see how anything from the guitar sitting behind you to the painting, it's all generating frequency. And when our eyes and ears and our senses engage frequency, it produces our perception of reality. And if, if the frequencies we're engaging are not wholesome, then we end up uh, mirroring that back in our own self-existence. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. I loved your explanation of how you have your own spiritual ritual and practice, including infusing your music and instruments with Reiki energy before you compose it. I thought that was a real sign to me that you are aware that your state of mind and your presence are infused into your work and actually are a key factor in the effect on the other listening or engaging it, which is very in line with my own work. So, uh, you know, the other thing too is, is I use these beautiful flower essences and, and uh, there, I can't remember the company's name, but I read the guy's book that made them because I was so impressed with them. He does a lot of different animal essences. And I read his book about how he makes them. And in brief, what he does is like, instead of going and getting an octopus out of the ocean and squeezing some juice out of it to make an essence, he connects his soul to the soul of the octopus. And then he channels the life force energy and the consciousness of the octopus into the base material that he makes his essences out of. And I was, what really impressed me is I had no idea that's how he was doing it, but I found these essences very powerful. For example, his bobcat essence is excellent when you got to get a lot of work done. You need to stay focused. Or I like to smoke pot when I paint, but sometimes it can end up making me kind of sit there and dream a lot. So if I just take a few drops of bobcat essence, I find I can keep my mind very focused and my lines straighter. So when I was listening to your description of that, I thought, you know, this is so important. And so few people that, that, make music or produce things for the public realize how much of themselves is in it. And you get a lot of people that maybe make good music or paint really well, but guys like me and you that are sensitive can pick up the underlying vibration. And so I, I think I'd love it if you could share with people what your process is and, and why that's so important to you as a composer an artist and a poet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when I first started making this music, um, the approach has definitely evolved and it's evolved because of the responsibility, uh, that I started really, um, seeing because we, you know, we started, it's not that it was not of a pure nature that there wasn't ritual involved It's that the ritual became more refined and it became more targeted and it also became, um, more of a priority to me because people were writing in saying, you know, this helped my son who's been sick, or this helped my daughter who has uh, autism. Uh, this helped my mother who had cancer. You know, we started getting these, these emails, testimonials, and people willing to open up, be vulnerable and share. And it was, you know, a real eye opener for me to realize like, I know that I'm making this music. I know I'm sending it out, but this became more tangible, more real, these connections with people and the profound effect it was having on people. And so 
I wanted to make sure that I was coming at it from the healthiest spot that I could um, and to be a clear channel to really ask spirit to help me with creating an album each month that was based in the astrology and the collective energy and to kind of really um, go beyond my wants and desires and to realize um, as a collective what what music needed to be channeled in and utilized in this program in that way. And so, um, you know, I just really asked for divine guidance and, and over the years it's really evolved into, it starts with incense and sage, you know, we kind of clear the space and all the equipment, um, and, you know, kind of set in meditation for a few minutes, do doing breath work and kind of clearing the mind. Um, and then just, setting with divine uh, words of, uh, you know, declarative statements like uh, God is the only power working here, you know, starting off with something very powerful that cleanses the space of any kind of uh, attachments or, you know, blockages or stagnant energy. Um, And then basically um, asking uh, for assistance, you know, um, to create music, uh, to be led, you know, to where, you know, the, the songs that need to be channeled in for that month. And so the, uh, energy work is done on myself. And then on the equipment, the things that I started realizing was I didn't want to just create tones from tone generators, uh, you know, where you put the tone in and just drag it out to the end of the session and say, okay, this is gone. So I knew that there was an opportunity when I'm holding a note where I'm giving a focus of a frequency from the start to the end of the track, since it's going to be playing for that duration, why don't I hold it down, put my energy into the key and fuse it just mentally envision, you know, the energy going through the keyboard into the computer for the, re- the recording, you know, into the microphones and through the acoustic instruments that we're using, touching them, uh, and constantly just being in thankfulness and gratitude uh, for these instruments, for these tools, for these resources to be able to provide this, you know, uh, and then infusing them with the energy the whole time of the recording, you know, just um, even on playback uh, when you're mixing, uh, you know, it's something to to set there and envision um, the interaction with the listeners um, as if they're there already but you just can't see them, you know, and it's a completely different uh, approach than just making things out of ego and out of entertainment purposes. You know, it's a, um, it's really kind of opening up. And the other thing I was going to say is there's even times where things happen where I believe that there's divine intervention where um, let's, there's been several months where I came up with songs and I felt really good about it. And then the song would just disappear. It would it would get erased. It would disappear. Wow. And I'd be, and and, uh, and I would say, well, what what happened there? And and I would my um, Evan, my studio uh, that works with me, a musician I've trained and worked with over the last couple of years, uh, works with me. He's like, I don't know what happened. Like he's like, doesn't make any sense. And I was like, well, I guess we're not supposed to put that song out. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know. And so there's things where things come together in the same way where I'm like, where did that part come from? You know, what, where, where did that, where did this come from? He was like, well, that's from a different song. I don't know why, why that's in there, you know? And it, it's just really odd, weird stuff. And I stopped trying to figure it out and just realized that it's a uh, divine intervention, you know, where, uh, we have assistance and putting together these tracks and it's just something that you kind of laugh at now you've learned, we've learned to kind of, um, just incorporate it into the, the normal you know, process of making the music. And so it's been really fun, uh, to be a part of. So, you know, a couple of things jumped into my head there. If, if, uh, Joseph Campbell was listening to this, he would say you are working from the eternal now. Uh, Okay. In other words, when you empty yourself and you let go of the ego, then there is no past, present or future. There's only the eternal now. And the other one is, have you ever heard of the book Quantum Jumping or Quantum Jumps by Cynthia Sue Larson? No. I think you'd find it fascinating. And if you search Cynthia Sue Larson, she has quite a lot of evidence about how we're constantly jumping timelines in the quantum potential. And without a long explanation of it, but she she really shows how things like those tracks being moved around 
and many other very interesting things can happen. And she's recorded countless cases of these types of experiences from people's lives. And I think you'd find that fascinating. So it wouldn't take long to search even on in the internet and just find podcasts so you don't have to read the whole book. But I think you'd find it fascinating. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I'll look that up. My life's mission, my legacy, has always been to teach the teachers. When I founded the Czech Institute, it wasn't to teach the masses. It was specifically to create masters that could impact the masses and reach far more people than I ever could. Just as a picture is worth a thousand words, a master has more power to help and heal than a thousand average healthcare professionals. If you listen to my podcast, then I'm confident you're already aware that the world is in a health crisis. This crisis isn't something that would be a crisis for healthy people with the wisdom to support the planet in healthy ways, as most native cultures did. It's a health crisis because of corporate greed and manipulation of the truth of what makes people healthy by the medical systems worldwide. Sadly, they're in the illness and disease business, not the healthcare business. The mission of the academy is to teach the teachers how to live and how to teach holistic health for both the professionals of the world and the masses. How the Czech Academy does this is by providing you with all of my courses, academy-only online seminars, and business training so you know how to run an effective holistic health business. It's structured so that you get the right training at the right place with the right mentors to succeed. Students are supported by group mentorships and a community of like-minded students. It's much easier to learn grow, and share when you have a tribe of intelligent, healthy, inspired, and motivated people, and that's exactly what the Czech Academy offers you. Great teachers are people who live or have lived what they preach. In the Academy, you will be taught by masterful instructors that model for you every step of the way what it is that you're meant to do, how to live, and what to teach. Learning from masters in a mastermind group setting will help you grow personally and professionally and create a practice you know truly helps people. If you're interested in applying to the Czech Academy to be the change the world needs now, go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy to apply now. Ian Ohm, capital A, capital U, capital M underscore, or more simply O-M, Ohm, is said to be the sound of creation in Hinduism. The Sufi mystics like Hazrat Inyat Khan and Holy, uh, Holy Man Joseph Riel speak of sound as the origin of the universe. I noticed as I was listening to the videos on your websites, which is very easy to navigate, by the way, thank you. And I also noticed how excellent your production quality is. I'm a real stereo fanatic. Right behind me is a very expensive stereo with some really unique equipment. So I'm very sensitive to the quality of recordings and nothing drives me nuttier than getting what I know is supposed to be good music. And then it sounds like crap when you play it on a good stereo. And when I was listening to your uh, music, it was just so well engineered and the sounds were really clear. I really appreciated that. Uh, but anyhow, to continue my statement there, you mentioned that you have subscriptions and that your music is updated to reflect astrology. And I found that very impressive. I've also studied cymatics, alchemy for many years, sound healing and the basis of astrology. Um, they all speak of the music of the spheres in deep meditation and a few shamanic, sh uh, shamanic ceremonies I've done with plant medicines. I've been able to hear the music of the spheres which is quite mind blowing. I'll never forget the first time it happened to me. I was just meditating, not with any plant medicines in me or anything. And I kept thinking, where's that music coming from? And I looked at my stereo and my stereo was off. And I realized that it was coming from inside of me. And I said to my soul, what is that? And my soul said, that is the sound of the universe. And I was just blown away because I'd studied it and, and heard about it, but I'd never actually had the experience of hearing it. And then since that time, I've probably had it happen four or five times more, but it's always like, I don't think you can ever get used to that. It's pretty mind blowing. So I'd love it if you could share your conception of sound as the basis of creation and your thoughts on the music of the spheres or the cosmos as an expression of sound. 
and how astrology plays into your compositions. Because when I listen to you or read on your website that you update the music for the subscribers each month based on astrology, my first thought was, well, I doubt he's just reading astrology reports. Maybe he's tapping into the vibration of the cosmos. I'd love it to, to just if you could sort of expand on some of these concepts, like the you know sound is the basis of creation, um, the music of the spheres, astrology, and and how and why it is that you do that for people. Yeah, yeah. So I think that the first thing you have to start with is when we're getting acclimated to this perceived reality you know, in the womb coming into the world, our first perception is through sound and vibration, right? So, and, and it's, it would make sense that sound and vibration are such a powerful tool of, you know, expressing, uh, the growth of, uh, consciousness, you know, um, you know, it's just, it's a very powerful tool. It's an amplifier. Um, and I remember, I'll just say this real quick. I think it's, uh, the umbrella Academy, it's a uh, show on Netflix, but it's also adapted from a comic book, uh, like a graphic novel, I believe. Um, and there's a character in there. One of the female characters has the ability to amplify sound and she can make take sounds like raindrops and then use it as a power, you know, for her to uh, move the rain or to create movement just through sound. She'll tune into the frequency of the sound and then she's able to amplify it and turn it into some other kind of movement of matter through that sound. And I always thought that was a very interesting uh, power that they were introducing in that comic book. And I thought that was really interesting because through chanting uh, mantras and, uh, you know, vocal toning, uh, you know, and works with frequency music, it's just really interesting. The, um, the power of amplification for an intention, you know, or a focus through, through sound. So I think like you think about God even, right? If all of these things are that way, maybe even that God uh, was building upon that amplification process and the development of the universe. It's just interesting to ponder, you know? Uh, so the, uh, the, the main thing that I always like to focus on too is sound palette. And, um, I know this is probably a weird concept, just like your taste palette, you have a sound palette that you're accustomed to. Like you get up in the morning, your house relatively has the same kind of sounds going on. You go to the workplace, same kind of sounds, you know, you drive in your car uh, on the same road every day, going into to and from the store or whatever it may be. You have these kind of sound palettes that you're accustomed to. But when you start working with frequency outside of those ranges, you know, and, and consistently developing a relationship with those, you're expanding the awareness through the expansion of that sound palette, right? So you're, you're putting more frequencies there. And what happens is the more conscious, um, the more uh, consistent that you are with those new frequencies, you're teaching your brain, this is important to me. So I want you to, to, to take notice of these frequencies, right? So people that are doing work with us for two weeks, a month, and they'll say stuff like, I'm hearing the birds and outside more. I'm noticing them more. Is it is it changing my hearing? And I said, it's changing your awareness because it's putting those focus, you know, your brain's like, okay, I got to take note of these. So they're hearing hums of engines, the trees blowing, the leaves blowing in the breeze, you know, all these things are becoming more in tune or they're becoming more in tune with their surroundings. And uh, I said, it's really the same thing. If you go sit in nature for a month, every day for four hours, right. And just sit in nature and meditate, you're going to become more acclimated to the frequencies in the forest than you are the noise of the city right? And you're going to start noticing more things that you kind of had blocked out before. So that's what I mean by the expansion of the sound palette leads to the expansion of consciousness, right? Yes. Because you're, you're taking in more information now and you're also utilizing it differently. You know, it's having an effect on your nervous system. It's having an effect on your brain wave activity. It's having an effect on the calmness of your body, which means that you're more open. And if you look at uh, Jose Silva, right? You, you, are you familiar with him? No. So the Silva method, uh, he was a uh, technician that worked on radios. And uh, he noticed that when he stepped the power down to the radio, the radio could pick up more signal from further distances. And he started ex experimenting with consciousness and started asking himself, well, 
if we step ourselves down in brainwave activity, are we more powerful creatively? Are we more powerful spiritually? Are we more powerful physically? When our brain is not overwhelmed with mundane tasks and we're, you know, chill, more chill, can we create powerful movement in our mind and body? And so he created a, a the Jose Silva uh, method and it, it goes from everything from cells and marketing to, uh, you know, basically doing binaural beat work without the binaural beats, just consciousness, you know. I've heard of work. the Silva method. I just don't yeah. think I knew his name was Jose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's In fact, it. my wife Angie has a bunch of his stuff. Okay, okay, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think like, um, and for me, I always have heard music, you know, just kind of con- to round that out is just, uh, um, w- I've done, um, you know, I did uh, acid and shrooms and peyote in my life when I was younger, you know, and I, and in those explorations, uh, I would always hear music and I felt like, I um, didn't know where it was coming from. I never uh, knew if it was from internal sources, but it was almost like I would hear music and it's really the birthplace of like getting inspired, you know, hearing uh, music that I wanted to bring into the world, you know. I I still, I still, uh, last thing, uh, I still remember Paul McCartney talking about Yesterday the song yesterday. And he said that he heard it over and over and over. And when he started writing it, he felt like he ripped somebody off and he kept showing the song to people. Have you heard this before? Have you heard this before? Have you heard this before? And they're like, nah, it's great. It's a beautiful song. And he was like, okay. And he said, but he said it it was so profound drilled into his head that it was like a gift. You know, the, the song came from, from somewhere else. And I just think that a lot of the music that I'm doing with listening to smile is very similar to that. It reminds me, have you ever heard of, of Ram Dass talking about what happened when his master, uh, I think it's Karoli Baba, had them all, that one of their first assignments when they went to India and started working with him was he had them chanting Om sometimes for hours a day. Have you heard that story? No. Oh, well, he, so they're chanting Om and that was their primary training in the beginning was just to chant Om together. And there was, you know, uh, Krishna Das was with him. He was one of the people in that group. And uh, then after, I can't remember how long it was, a couple of weeks or a month or something, he went to his master and he said, Master, why am I hearing Om going nonstop in my head? Like there's just this, like there's countless people singing inside of me. (laughs) And his master said, because you have tapped into the collective And you are now linked to every person that is or has ever chanted Om in the world because you're you've accessed the frequency of Om. Wow. That's intense. That's really cool. Yes. Um from what I could remember of music and healing theory, percussion instruments primarily influence the nervous system. I'd love it if you can give us an overview of uh, you know, I know this is very deep, so I don't expect you to, you know give us a whole book, but just some general concepts, I think, because it'll help people understand music as healing. If you could share, what are some of the instruments, frequencies, and influences that act on different parts of the body, the physiology or the psyche, such as heart rate, blood pressure, autonomic balance, mental, emotional stress. Like as a man who makes music for healing, you must have sort of a a deep knowledge of if I want to shift somebody's heart or their breathing or their digestion, how do you, can you give us a bit of an expose of, of some of these concepts? Yeah. So I am a little different from most like a music therapist or something of that nature. So when I'm working to target something specifically, the first thing I start with is frequency, right? And based off of that frequency, the next thing I look at is tempo. And so tempo is a very powerful thing, like 85 beats per minute, uh, you know, between like 75 and 85 beats per minute, I found is a very powerful sweet spot to kind of step down the nervous system, the brainwave activity, the heart rate. Um, It's just something that really helps people in general to slow down. That's very fast. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you you know, in meditation, you'll drop them down further, but I'm saying like anything that has like a hand drum or anything like that, you can get like a 75 to 85 beats per minute, and it really helps to step people down. And the other thing I should say is 
I don't like to start meditations off with meditation music. I know that probably sounds crazy, but like if someone, if we're hosting an event, the first two songs that we do are mid tempo. And the reason is, is like people going through parking garages or parking lots and traffic. And then they just come and it's like, okay, let's meditate guys. And it's just drop right in. It's just not, it doesn't work. You know, you got to meet them where they're at. Yeah, exactly. And so we meet them where we do some intention setting and some breath work and we step them down with these mid tempo songs and it just starts downshifting. So the last song we end on might be 30 beats per minute, you know, very, very chill. Um, and so I found that also the intervals in between notes or chord chords um, has a very profound effect. Like if I play like a C chord and the next chord in that pr- progression would be G, right? So uh, let's say that's where we're going with it and we played C and let's say I held it. I just held the sustaining chord. One, two, three, four, and we might go to eight and then bring in the next chord, right? What that's doing is it's put that linger between the, the interval between those two chords. Um, it starts giving the brain like the brain's like, where are we going? What's next? You know, and then like as it starts getting into that tempo, like I could play a, a choppy rhythm. Dun, 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 dun. But if I just play a, a one hit strike and then let it sustain to the next chord progression. What it's doing is it's teaching, it's like, it's telling the body, oh, okay, okay, we got, we're letting it linger, (laughs) you know? know? And that interval of silence between those notes makes the next note more powerful, but it also is setting up the body for that relaxation, that, that letting go that needs to take place. So the intervals in between notes is a powerful thing the space in between, and then the tempo and the frequency. And that's really where I start. But uh, typically people will say uh, drums are like root chakra. Uh, And some people even say heart, uh, you know, with with drums and there's different mindsets with it. But I found that guitar and flute um, are very, very powerful for throat and for lungs and for um, a a lot of other things. Uh, But the 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 throat chakra and, and then the lungs people that are having respiratory issues or like uh the flu or you know a cold that's in their chest um i've seen that guitar is just a really prou- powerful thing in that movement of that energy for whatever reason that is um you know and so i i love native american flutes i have a one of my friends who's a shaman This is a flute that's made in 528. It's a bamboo flute. And he put the colors on each of the holes here for the the notes. And he put an infinity symbol here and a lightning bolt uh, on the on the the shaft here. And it's just it's really, really a powerful uh, flute. And we use this in a lot of the shamanic album, uh, you know, the songs that are in 528. And so, um, yeah, I just I love uh, the, the air, the wind. Uh, instruments are just so powerful for creating relaxation in general. It's a really uh, powerful tool. Isn't 528 the heart chakra? 528 is uh, in the solfagio is associated with the solar plexus. And then, then there's the heart chakra. Six, so 528 is the solar plexus and 639 hertz would be the heart chakra. Okay, yeah. And the solfagio. It's interesting because different books give different frequencies for that. Right, exactly. So I think it, uh, it varies depending on, you know, because a lot of these people are sharing what they feel, but I think there can be a little difference in our perception and, you know, depending on who we are and what's going on in our life at the time. Yes, for sure. Well, that's that's really interesting. I, I love all that stuff. And and as I said, I have studied a number of books. I have quite a section in my library on, you know, sound healing and music theory. And I've uh, studied, you know, and used tuning forks and all sorts of stuff for healing work. And so I have enough background in it. But when I do a healing ceremony, I actually don't think at all. I just empty the bone and let my soul guide me to what instruments to use and all that. So I, I, I just let, I connect to the soul of the individual and ask their soul to guide me. But I also like knowing, you know, for example, when I studied uh, shamanism and always do study it, but practice it a lot, 
I learned that the rattles in Native American Indian healing philosophy were meant to represent rain and the function was to wash pain out of the body. Yes. And so I've spent years working with rattles and drums and and have quite a selection of them. And I find rattles are very, very good when people have a lot of blocked up um, emotional energy in them. Yeah. Rain sticks are awesome too in that regard too. Yeah, yeah I have a yeah. beautiful big Aboriginal one, probably like five feet long, and it's very powerful. Wow, does that go for a long time? Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, somebody gave it to me as a gift, and and uh, uh, I love it. It's sitting. We have a music room in the house, and sometimes we go in there with the kids, and just we have a piano and a, and a you know drums and various rattles and toys and we'll just get in with the kids and start just spontaneously letting whatever comes out comes out that's awesome yeah now sound doesn't just affect the body through the eardrum i'd love it if you can give us an overview of the different ways sound affects us and how it does it yeah so it's it's interesting because sound has so many multifaceted uh you know, ways in which it can stimulate. Like if you're familiar with the movie, um, uh, alive inside, have you seen that? No. Is it good? Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. I, I would highly suggest it. It's called alive inside and it's, uh, a documentary about, uh, going to retirement communities, especially working with Alzheimer's and dementia and using sound, uh, using music to engage. And there's several video uh, clips from there where, Uh, People were just unresponsive. They put on headphones and played the music of their day, you know, their era. Um, Yes, I have seen it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. People that were completely unresponsive woke up. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a, you know, it's traveling through the ears, but in dementia, you know, the, the part of the brain that lights up. Uh, with music, uh, you know, which the brain, it, it's one of the few things that lights up most of the brain all at once. You know, music's a very powerful because it has, you have memory recall, you've got, you know, it, it, the, the hemi- left and right hemispheres are affected by different uh, frequencies and different instruments. And they're even seeing now in studies that cultural uh, music and the different scales from different cultures of music are lighting up different parts of the brain, which is really interesting to see that develop, you know, that uh, trial develop more. And, uh, you you know, but it's just, it's so powerful that like I constantly talk about people that have emotional connection. Like let's say that um, one of my friends, her dad played Native American flute and he passed away. And the way that she remembers that instrument and the way that the closeness of that instrument to her heart every time she hears it is much, much power, more powerful than someone that just kind of has no connection to that instrument. Do you know, do you know what I mean? And so it, it allows a deeper uh, sense of connection to those instruments. And I also think it doesn't even have to be memory. I think that there's people who uh, intuitively feel connected to instruments from the get-go. And for me, those two instruments are the cello I love I love the cello and I love a tie between the pipa, which is a, a, a Chinese instrument, and the hammer dulcimer. Like oh, yeah, I, just, I have a hammer dulcimer. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I love hammer dulcimers. They're so beautiful. Um, and you know, so I think like I don't I um, have played hammer dulcimer and I've played a pipa, uh, but um, I just knew from the first time I heard them that I was connected to those instruments, you know, and in some way beyond this life, you know? Um, and I think that all of us have those kind of spirit instruments, you know, that really speak to us. And so when, when you find that spirit instrument, that connection, I think it's much more profound of the, the effect it has on your body, uh, and, and your release work and healing. And so then, you know, there's also the effects like, you know, you see people do gong bath and they'll take a blood sample before the gong bath and a blood sample after the gong bath, or they'll do the heart rate. So you've got like brainwave activity changing, You've got heart rate that's being affected. You've got blood work that's showing different uh, levels of uh, uh, immunity changing just from being at a 30 minute to an hour sound bath, right? Uh, You've got, um, you know, the power of changing your mood and feelings. You've got, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's so, the amount, the effects of music are so profound and powerful. And, And the last thing I'll say is, um, 
if you went to a blockbuster movie and you turn the volume down of the music, but you left all the, the, you know, dialogue of the movie, that movie would be vastly different. And the, the the epicness and all of the climaxes and all of those things would be non-existent. You know, the music adds so much. And so I try to explain to people, your self-care practices can be elevated and amplified through a soundtrack that is created specifically for you and your routine. Um, you know, it's like having your own powerful soundtrack that amplifies the experience for you. And it's just, it's a really powerful um emotional burst, you know, amplification, you know. If I remember too from watching that documentary Alive Inside and maybe others, one of the things that really shocked the researchers was is that Alzheimer's patients immediately remembered their favorite music when it was played to them. Yeah, they started singing the lyrics. And yeah, they knew yeah. and and the researchers mm -hmm. were like, how in the world is this happening? They don't even know who their husband is that they were married to for 35 years or their wife, but they remember the exact tracks that they used to love. And, and then people started seeing improvements in other aspects of their memory once they started playing that music. You know, one of the things I was kind of pointing to with my question there was that music doesn't just come through our ears. The vibration affects our bones. It affects all the membranes, the, you know, every single cell has a membrane, every single muscle fiber. You've got thousands and thousands of layers of fascia in, in muscle. So it's, it's really the, the whole body becomes a uh, sympathetic resonator for the music. And so it's really healing us from the inside, not just the outside. Right. And when you think about have you, you cymatics, right? Yes, you see how course, the yeah. water is affected. And then you think about the human body being, you know, it's debatable between 70 and 80 percent made of water. Right. And so then you think, well, how can the body not be affected when you see water in these cymatics videos being affected in these beautiful geometric patterns? And, you know, it's just it's uh, like when you look at structured water versus unstructured water. Right. Yes. Um, you know, when you see that those diagrams, you're like, wow, this is geometric. This is mathematical that, you know, it's 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 sacred geometry. You know, it's what it is. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. I actually did a, a course that you can buy by Deva Pramal and Meeton, her husband, on mantra. And they give a really beautiful, it comes with, I think, a couple of CDs and a book uh, as well. And having studied uh, sound the healing and therapy, one of the things that I found, and I think Eileen Day McCusick talks about this, she's a world famous sound healer using uh, tuning forks. If you haven't checked her, her work out, it's amazing. I've talked to her on the phone before. It was yeah, cool. she's yeah, really yeah. a cool lady. I've interviewed her on my podcast. She'd probably love the interview. But um, one of the things that I came across was research on Tibetan Buddhist monks 
And one of the things they found is that when they chanted and toned, that their cerebral spinal fluid became purified and structured. Wow. And they found that chanting and toning was actually somehow literally taking um, toxins and impurities right out of the cerebral spinal fluid. And I've always had my own theory that the cerebral spinal fluid is really the liquid crystal display that allow us to have images of our thoughts. If you can kind of visualize like how a plasma screen would work and then imagine the electromagnetic energy of thought and your brain's full of cerebral spinal fluid, which is a very different type of uh, liquid than any other part of the body. It's, it's a, it's a much different, uh, it's got a lot of, it's highly structured. Uh, Gerald Pollack talks about it in the easy zone and the negative polarities of the water and a variety of other things. But when you think about how powerful these things are, and then you go back to, you know, almost all the spiritual traditions, whether they be gospel singing or churches, singing is such an important part of all these spiritual traditions. And, and we're basically using ourself as an instrument and coupling, hopefully, positive intentions with sound, which I think really not only affects our physical systems, but our soul itself. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, the thing is, so music it can be so powerful on its own, but when you pair intention and you pair some, like, just like we were talking about, you know, having little snippets of positive, uh, you know, like affirmations or mindsets or mantras over music is so powerful because you're getting that feeling of the music. And if you have something hopeful and enjoy, and then you're putting these very powerful, it's a way that you're reprogramming. You're using, f you're, you're using the frequency of that feeling that, that the music's creating. And then you're using these words, which are then going in and really sticky. You know how people get songs stuck in their head and they're singing lyrics, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a form of entrainment. You know, you're reconditioning the brain through these affirmations and it's a very powerful tool. Yes, I love it. Ian, I've studied several death midwives and noticed that they are often harpists and use other forms of music to help people transition. I also know from studying the birthing process that sounds in the room during delivery can impact the child in positive or negative ways. I'd love it if you could share your thoughts as it relates to using music to help aid birthing and dying. Yeah, so... Just recently, we got the blessing, the opportunity um, to work with a hospice center uh, in South Carolina here. And uh, we put our, uh, they had 20 rooms. And so uh, they put two of our albums and then a uh, one page uh, information about the music so that patients and clients could uh, utilize that music as a tool, um, you know, in the rooms. And we trained the staff on uh, becoming more familiar with helping to make selections of tracks and frequencies for people. Um, so just being a part of that is is a major blessing. Uh, I used to hear the stories about how some of the people in those environments uh, in the transition time uh, were loving to hear Rumi poetry. People would read Rumi poetry to people that were... You know, I have Rumi's entire collection in my library. About, awesome. I've got about 45,000 Rumi poems. Man, he's uh, truly one of my favorite. Him and Hevez are, you know, both of the, are, I just love so much. But because I, I heard those stories of people, you know, that were in transition getting Rumi poems read to them, I just thought, man, that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I said, I hope uh, I would love to be a part of that with my music. And the the universe heard that. Uh, request and it started bringing opportunities um, to us to work in those environments. And I feel like it's such a blessing um, to uh, help, you know, with those tools to, you know, instill hope, uh, beauty, joy uh, in those moments of, you know, that could be filled with fear, or anxiety, but just trying to replace those um, with a, a sense of peace. And I think music's very powerful in that. So I think, um, for me, harp, uh, is such a beautiful instrument. Um, and I think a lot of people subconsciously associate it with heaven and angels, 
you know, like when you think about a heart. So I think that's one of the reasons that it's so powerful and profound in those moments. You know, you ever listen to Hillary Stagg? No. Oh man, you got to try Hillary Stagg. He is just the most phenomenal harpist. Okay. Uh, one of his CDs is Feather Light. He's got all of his CDs are amazing. I can't tell you what's going to happen when you listen to Hillary Stagg, man. Okay. I'm excited. When I do deep medicine ceremonies with people, especially if it's their first time on plant medicines, I most always play Hillary Stagg because it's so stabilizing and grounding. It's like I can take people into a deep ceremony and keep them safe with Hillary Stagg's music. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Um, have you heard uh, Lisa Lynn, the harpist? No, I haven't. Yeah, she's really awesome too. I'll write it down. Lisa Lynn. Is it L Y N N? Yes. I have two other harpists in my collection. I love that you have real albums. I still collect vinyl and album CDs. You know, I'm not a huge digital uh, person, so I love yeah, physical copies. I, I have CDs um, yeah. just because of the density of the sound is much higher. And my speakers, like if I plug my iPhone in and play tracks, it doesn't even come close to the density of a CD. I love, you know, when you put as much money as I did into a stereo, it, you're, it, the beauty of it is, is it's very sensitive to good stuff, but it lets you know when you got junk recordings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Excellent. Was there anything else you wanted to share before we go on birth and dying? Uh, yeah, so the birth um, process, I always find very, uh, f- for the mother, and you know, the family, the, um, th- the uh, nurses and the doctors that are, uh, in the room as well. I think it's just very, very, um, soothing if you could create an environment that's frequency based, uh, you know, that just like, what I mean by that is people will come to these meditations. We call them sonic meditations. And, uh, in those meditations, they'll say, as soon as they walk into the room and the music's playing, they said, it feels like there's like an invisible curtain that they just walk through and the vibration and the feeling in the room is much different than where they came out of in the hallway, you know, that they just feel like everything has changed. And so I think if you could set up a, an environment of peace in the birthing room for, for the mother and the child, as well as the people, the staff that are working, um, you're going to create an overall feeling of connectedness, cohesiveness. You're going to, you know, everyone's going to be kind of vibing on the same you know, feeling and vibration. And I think that that could, you know, that could only be a good thing, you know, cause you're, you're trying to relieve stress and you're trying to connect people through vibration. And I could see it be, being a very powerful tool, um, you know, to aid in that, uh, process. Especially to during surgery, I'll tell you of a situation that happened. Um, I used to always go to surgery with any of my patients that needed surgery because I like to learn and see what the surgeon did. And and I found it was easier to rehabilitate people if I actually had firsthand knowledge of what had to be cut, moved, changed, et cetera, in surgery. And I'll never forget. And later, of course, they've proven this through lots of research, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. But one of the surgeons I was working with, I just happened to be chatting with him. And he says to me, you know, that lady that you were in surgery with a couple of weeks ago, I said, yes, Mrs. So-and-so. He goes, well, she came to me for her post-surgical visit and something really odd happened. And now what had happened is after she went under general anesthesia, the surgeon I was working with brought a boom box in and he put on some music that he liked to do the surgery to. He said the, the lady sat down and told me that she, uh, heard all the music I was playing and could could even tell me what we were talking about. And I wow. said, well, and the surgeon said, well, I told her that's impossible because you're under general anesthesia. So she then told me exactly what the tracks of music were and even told me what conversations we were having in the operating room. And he was so shocked. He goes, have you ever heard of anything like that? And I told him, well, yes, I have. But the reality of it is, is that what this research shows, and there's plenty of it now, is that we're actually conscious when we're unconscious of things like conversations, music, 
And so it really goes to show you, like, if, if you're an, a surgeon and you're using music in the operating room that the person doesn't like, it actually could be stressful for them, and it is affecting them. Right. Yeah. Um, what's really cool, uh, you know, like you think about when you're sleeping, right? And there's, there's people that will listen to those entrainment tapes while they sleep. And I feel like they're very powerful. You know, the subconscious mind is always dialed in just like what you're referring to in this, you know, kind of uh, twilight state that she was in. I think it's really, it's such a cool thing. Yes. I noticed on your website that your music uses chakra frequencies. Oh, oh we didn't, did we get into that? No, we, we didn't. Yeah. You use chakra frequencies, planetary frequencies, Schumann resonance, and solfeggio frequencies. We talked a bit about the planetary f- uh, frequencies in the music of the spheres, spheres, but I'm interested in hearing more about how you use Schumann resonance, solfeggio frequencies, and maybe you can explain what they are for the listeners, but I'd also like to have you unpack um, in some of my books. And my buddy Jason that I was telling you about earlier bought me a whole set of CDs tuned to the chakras that were based on the frequencies. I think it might be solfeggio, but there was a time when the music industry shifted the frequencies and basically threw it out of tune from what I understand. I'm wondering if you could kind of help us, uh, you know, to me, a Schumann resonance is a standing wave. I think the earth's Schumann resonance is 8.9 Hertz. If I remember 8.83 or 8.9 or something like that. 7.83. 7.83. 7.83. 7.83. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And most shamanic trances are brought in on that frequency from the drumming frequency. Yeah. So it, could you just tell us a little bit about what a Schumann resonance, the solfeggio resonances are, and why those are important? Yeah. So the it's really interesting. Um, the solfeggio is what really resonates with me personally. My my favorite, uh, the Gregorian chants were tuned in there in that range. And um, there's a lot of, um, you know, all the chakras that are based off of the solfeggio come from that A equals 444. And so the Schumann resonance is tuned to A equals 432. And in different time periods, classical music used different tunings, you know, 432 and 444. From what, the, <clears throat> from what I understand, some of the conductors would tune to A equals 444 when they wanted brighter strings in their orchestras. They wanted the strings to really cut through the mix um, and be a higher, the, the 444 is a, you're tuning up so the string tension becomes tighter. And and so the, the sound was brighter. And so a lot of, from what I understand, uh, they wanted it to cut through the mix, and so those would be tuned in that in that tuning. Um, there's also uh, uh, Dr. Leonard Horowitz. You know, the Book of Five Two Eight talks a lot about Bob Marley, uh, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and says that they have recorded songs in A equals four forty four. Um, and then you've got 432, which is, was traditionally the concert pitch for classical music. And it was really where music was mostly residing a lot of the time, uh, for the, the tuning. Um, and then you have the introduction of 440, uh, in an attempt to standardize all the musicians playing together, uh, and being able to write a piece of music that people around the world could play together. Different musicians from different villages or towns coming together could, you know, play things without going through the whole tuning thing. Um, The thing that's interesting about this is the conspiracy, (laughs) which is is, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Henry Ford Foundation um, looked at the rise to power of the Nazi party. And they looked at some of the things that the Nazis were doing to gain power so quickly. Um, And they were looking at how they were able to control and create a docile uh, following, you know, with their people. And so they said, hey, we want to do that over here in our factories. We want to create non-uniqueness. We don't want special speciality. We don't want, you know, individualism. We want conformity. We want assembly line workers. We Zombies. want Zombies. Yeah, exactly. And so they started um, implementing, you know, uh, different curriculum in the schools based on these studies that they were doing of Hitler's rise to power. And they were looking at how he was controlling the population. And they even started pushing for fluoridation of the water 
they started pushing for different uh, academic um, uh, curriculum in the schools. And then they also ultimately pushed for music to be introduced and for the tuning to be 440, A equals 440. And so um, a lot of people believe, uh, especially Dr. Leonard Horowitz is a very, um, you know, powerful person that speaks out on this all the time, but he was showing how um, the the introduction of uh, what they call the devil's interval. Yeah. The, you know, between the the notes, the intervals of music, they were saying is very dissident to the growth of uh, consciousness. human. Yes. Consciousness and, and, and even muscle tissues and, and uh, you know, just uh, living cells of plants and animals and, and humans. And so, um, you know, when you look at 440, there are designs that are created in cymatics with that music. But when you look at A equals 444 and A equals 432, which is Schumann resonance and solfagio, the cymatics designs are much greater. They're they're much, much more evolved and uh, uh, intricate and, uh, you know, structured you know, a lot more than what 440 is. I mean, you can more look harmony. at it. Yeah, exactly. And so um, it's just a very interesting thing. Um, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it, the other thing is that I'll just bring up with, you know, at the risk of sounding like a crazy person, but basically Project Paperclip, if you're familiar with that. I've heard stole. of it. I don't know the details. Okay. Yeah, so we stole all the scientists from Germany and brought them over here. And, you know, Warner von Braun, a bunch of the other, of the scientists became, you know, working at NASA, working on our space program, working on uh, secret government projects. Um, I ultimately believe that the deep state came from these Nazi scientists, you know, moving up in the ranks. Yes, and there's creating. a lot of evidence of that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but, you know, basically uh, these, these scientists were studying things that were beyond uh, knowledge of pretty much all things happening at that time they were developing lasers they were developing fighter jets they were developing zero gravity machines yes flying saucers exactly yeah, uh, hitler, even hitler uh, sorry let me let me share something real quick have you ever heard of victor schauberger yes okay he was a forest ranger from austria who was a genius on water and many other things i've got several of his books in my library they're just mind-blowing well, when he was captured by Hitler during the Second World War, Hitler took him, brought all the scientists they'd capture, and told him, build me a flying saucer or I'll kill you. <laughs> wow. And they actually built, he was able to build a flying saucer, but when they tried to power it up and launch it, it took off, flew up through the roof of the building, blew the roof off the building, and got about 1,500 feet in the air and then just took off but they couldn't figure out how to control it. Uh, and fortunately they couldn't figure out how to control it, but cause he did not want the Hitler having this technology. So he, he may have known how to control it, but, but didn't let Hitler know how to control it. But, you know, you mentioned Rockefeller. He's the founder of the American medical association and, and the, 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 He's the one behind getting rid of all the naturopaths and the homeopaths. I mean, these are the witch hunters, and unfortunately, uh, they're very, very involved in what's going on today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sorry to interject that there, but I just no. didn't want to forget that little piece. Yeah, no, no, no. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on the go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it, and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water, and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick, easy, and effective? 
to get your Organifi immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. Basically, when you start researching and looking below the surface, you see that these scientists were working on mind control. They were working, you know, which was where I think Project uh, MK, you know, uh, Ultra came from uh, ultimately. But uh, they were working on sound wave. Uh, they were trying to control brainwave activities through sound. They were work. I mean, they were working on profound, deep, you know, sci-fi you know, science fiction stuff that was reality. And, you know, we stole all of those scientists and brought them over here. And so, you know what they call that now, don't you? What? <laughs> I don't know. Social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're too far off on that. Have you seen the uh, documentary on Netflix, Social Dilemma? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, there you go. Yeah. Even the guys, exactly. every single one of the pioneers of, 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 social media said they do not allow their children to use it because they know how dangerous it is. One of the guys said, we let a dragon out. We don't know how to get it back in now. And one of the most profound statements in that whole documentary was a guy, I believe he was from Google. He said, the problem is now we've convoluted the truth or distorted the truth so much. Nobody knows what the truth is, not even us. (laughs) <laughs> that that's yeah. quite a statement from an expert in in uh programming people's minds i rem- i still remember there was a a statement in the 80s from the cia director that said when everything the american people believes is false our job here is done and exactly that was in the 80s yeah well, they're almost the there yeah this exactly. is a very good litmus test i think that's a lot of what's going on in the world is to see how well their brainwashing program is working fortunately there's a, a few of us like me and you and most Czech professionals that are too wise for that. And I think if anybody's tuned in to their own body and their own emotions and their own inner self, you can feel the distortion whenever you're exposed to a lot of this stuff. I find, for example, being on uh, things like Instagram or any of these things very stressful. I just it, it, it feels as though I'm being taken over by something. And whenever I find myself all of a sudden having this like addictive tendency to check on stuff, I know that I've got a virus inside of me that's not healthy because it's it's taking you over from the inside and it, it's exactly what they engineered it to do. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I think we're we're coming into an age of intuition where people are realizing that your doctors really don't have more information than you do. Like for instance, if you were to talk about nutrition with most doctors, most have most doctors ha- simply do not have the education to even have a conversation with you about nutrition because I think I heard a, a I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I heard a statistic that said that I think that some of the doctors take between eight to 10 hours of nutritional education and their whole school experience. You well, know? you actually doubled the truth research. I did research into this. The average American medical doctor gets four hours of training four in hours. nutrition, all of which is corporate crap. Right. A study out of New Zealand showed in New Zealand, they did a study and showed that any mother that has one child or more is much more knowledgeable on nutrition than the average doctor in New Zealand. And New Zealand doctors have much better training than the typical American doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, I just think that nutrition is is a, such a powerful tool for rebuilding the body um, and to give it the the immune the immune system the the functionality of repair and rebuilding uh, comes from the, what we eat. Like that whole thing, you are what you eat, is such a powerful statement because it's true, you know. Um, and so I think it's so funny how everyone wants to push pharmaceuticals that cause more side effects than they do helping the problem. Uh, than just eating something, changing diet. And uh, I think that's where we're at is people are going to realize through COVID and through this awakening that's taking place that 
you know, we've given our power away massively and it's time to intuitively tune in and to learn that you know what you need and it's just about getting in tune with your body and and the rise of intuition becoming a big focus of the planet yeah and i think the first step to that is disconnecting yourself from any of the mainstream television outlets any of the addictive social media outlets uh, gaming people are they don't realize how powerful these technologies you know we're talking about music but research on light shows that light has an infinite capacity to carry frequencies. So you can actually encode massive amounts of information to light. So while you're watching your cartoons, you don't realize you're being brainwashed to buy things and do things that you don't want to do, which is why this stuff is so dangerous to expose children to. And, um, you know, there was another thought that I had in this regard is that when you look at cymatics, if you look at the book Blueprint for Immortality by Harold Saxon Burr, which is a mind-blowing book, he did this research in 1947 at Yale University. I've talked about this on my podcast before, but it's worth repeating. This guy was a genius. He was really one of the pioneers of figuring out how the body was an electrical organism. And he had this concept that he researched the following way. He took plants of the same genus and he divided these, he put these seeds in and he potted the little seeds, right? Just the seed in the soil. And, and there was quite a lot of them. I imagine maybe 60 or a hundred in each group from the plant, from the pictures in the book. And then he broke them into two groups. Then he took glass mason jars of water and he had his students hold on to that water and keep it close to their body for three to four hours. And then he took the same basic glass mason jars, filled them up with water, and got permission to go to a psych ward where people were locked up for being insane. And he let them interact with the water for three to four hours. He watered group A with the water from his students and plants from group B with the water from that had been interacted with by cyclically ill people. And he shows what happens when those plants grew. The water from the students grew normal plants. But when you see the group of plants watered by the psychically ill people, they were crooked, gnarly, they looked sick, and they often grew away from the sun, not toward the sun. Wow. And, and that, so the point I'm bringing up is when you think of consciousness as the flow of energy and information and you think that vibration is the basis of the creative power behind the universe a plant that lives in nature and is not being disturbed by unnatural sounds and these plants are surely being informed by the music of the spheres because steiner talks all about it alchemists talk about it Steiner gives very clear descriptions about how the frequencies and the intelligences from each of the different uh, planets in our solar system shows up and how plants grow, the type of plants. He shows you how to determine what plant is primarily influenced by what planet. So when you start looking at all the chaos we're inducing into the environment, you got Bill Gates trying to take over the farmlands and use biotech, uh, genetic modification. You're talking about Monsanto putting growing plants that produce pesticides inside of them. And people don't realize that if this whole agenda with Bill Gates and, and this whole movement that's going on continues, we're going to utterly and completely destroy the planet and each other. And that brings me, amazingly, to my next question, which is, Ian, if you look at the world and the crisis we're going through worldwide as though the Earth was your patient, what would your diagnosis and prognosis be as a sound therapist? In other words, if you see the world and its population as a patient and you are being asked, what is the diagnosis and what is the prognosis? What do you see in the world from your knowledge as a sound therapist, artist, poet, and wise man? Yeah. Well, what's really interesting is uh, I talk about this a lot, and I know this might sound weird, but I often say that I think one of the best things that could happen to us is losing technology. 
Uh, and, you know, um, I said if we ever did get that solar flare uh, that took out everything, yes, it would be challenging. Yes, there would be accommodations and luxuries. Why would it be peaceful, though? That would be lost, yes. But so, you know, I just, the last 10 years, I lived in Charleston, South Carolina, and I also lived in Pittsburgh, right? And those are larger you know, metropolitan areas, you know, Charleston's growing about 70,000 people a year to the, a to that area. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's massive growth and they don't really have the infrastructure to support it. And so it's very crowded, uh, you know, traffic wise, and it's very noisy, uh, if you're living downtown and <clears throat> the, uh, Pittsburgh was really no different. And so I just recently moved to a rural town in South Carolina doing work here. Right. And I, one of my friends came up from Charleston and we were hanging out and we were walking in this town where there's not a lot going on. And he said, how do you live here? And I said, very peacefully. And, yeah. and, 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 and he said, but, and I said, just listen. And I, and I just paused and I said, do you hear that? And he's like, what? I was like, nothing. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's no beeping, there's no construction, there's no, you know, trucks and planes. Horns, and, crashes, yeah. bangs, clangs. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, you know, and so to answer your question, I think basically, I think my diagnosis would be a super cluttered mind. I think that most of us do things and we don't even know why we do them. We just feel like an obligation or responsibility to do it. And I think that we've over over obligated ourselves to things that really have no meaning. And so most of our lives are peeling away and we're going to realize it at that moment of death. Uh, what have I done? What did I really spend my time doing? Uh, in life. And it's one, of, you know, I was working at a bank holding company. I had a good job when I was, you know, 23, 24. Uh, well, I guess I was 22, 23. And, uh, you know, I was setting the guy that I started working with the same week is now vice president of that bank, you know. Uh, but I left, you know, after two years, I told my parents, I said, I cannot do this job. I was like, I have a nice 401k. I've got good pay. I've, you know, there's room to grow, but I hate it. I, this isn't what my life is for. I'm not here to do this. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be a musician and artist. And they were like, oh, man. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. yes. Thank the yeah. Lord. You listen <laughs> to your soul, baby. Yeah. So it's, you know, of course, there's things that you compromise and give up here and there to do what you do. But I would not trade anything. And I think that that is the diagnosis is most of us really have, you know, and, and I was one of those people. We really had no idea what our our life mission or life purpose was we had no idea what true joy was or freedom was um you know and and someone said to me do you like what you do and i said of course and they said well are you rich are you well taken care of and i said i'm taken care of i'm not rich but i said you know the thing that i have is freedom i, I pick and choose who i work with i get to you know i have complete control over my schedule i you know i can do what i want when i want to and i said that's an amazing gift that most people in the world do not know you know you can't there's no price tag on that Right, exactly. And so um, I think that the world uh, as a patient would just be, how can we help to unclutter the mind and help to get more uh, focused on what the real, what your real passion is? I think finding that passion is going to unlock the the release work and the healing that needs to be done. And I think it's it starts with, you know, consciously breaking the cycle like you were talking about earlier, um, unplugging. And I think that uh, that frequency, meditation, mantras, affirmations are all powerful tools of disengagement. You know what I'm saying? Like where you're unplugging. Totally. Um, and, and I think that once you do that, then you have a real chance at figuring out the rest, you know? Yes. It, you know, as a therapist myself, what I see is all this technology has brought us so heavily into the realm of mental thinking, mind sphere, that we've completely lost our roots in the earth. We've lost hardly anybody puts their feet on the earth. Hardly anyone knows where their food's coming from. Hardly anybody touches animals or smells the smells of nature or the colors of nature. And so what happens is, is I believe we've become kites in strong winds with no tails. And if you've ever flown a kite without a tail, it's really radical and it just crashes and self-destructs. 
And so I think we really have a serious loss of consciousness, not only at the root chakra, but at the second chakra, because that's the home of our libido. And our libido, in a normal, healthy person, the libido or life force energy is distributed by way of the instincts. The instinct to eat when you're hungry, but eat real food. The instinct to move. The instinct to drink. The instinct to move your bowels. The instinct to create. The instinct to connect. And we are so completely, utterly disconnected from our instincts that what's happening is we're actually just being entrained like remote control toys. And as you know, we're being farmed as profit centers because companies like Google and Facebook get paid by how many seconds they can keep you on. So we we really have got to get back to organic food and organic farming. And when you look at Bill Gates's whole horseshit premise about why we need to use biotech, he says we cannot feed the world through standard or organic farming methods, which is absolute crap. I've got an amazing book in my library called Farmers of 40 Centuries by Professor Hollis King, who was sent by the United States Department of Agriculture to Japan, to Korea, and to several third world countries. And they were specifically wondering how in the world, because the China's only got 14% of its land mass is arable or farmable land, yet they're feeding way more people than we are. And this report was written in 1910. Wow. And he showed that the average Chinese farming family could produce far more food on one and two thirds of an acre than the average American farming family was producing on 40 acres, which the average American farming family at that time said was too little land to feed one family and they were recycling their own poop he called it midnight soil they were farming organically they were doing everything by hand the statistics he gives for how much food and animals produce and animals they produced on one and two thirds of an acre was magnitudes of order bond what anything corporate farming is producing And without a long rattle, we have basically destroyed the world in the name of science. Everything that's destroying us and the planet is backed by so-called science. But you track that science back and it always ends up with someone like the Rockefeller Foundation or some large corporation that's got an ulterior motive, which is always control and money and nothing else. Yeah. Well, um, you know... (sighs) It's so interesting because if you look at, there's two things I'll say real quick. And that is if you look at the drug trade, it's, it's really interesting that the American government has gotten caught red handed peddling cocaine, heroin, and, uh, you know, harder drugs, right? Yep. CIA is famous for it. Right. So then you look at hallucinogenics. What do hallucinogenics do? connect you to the earth and to they higher do. consciousness. <laughs> That's right. And so how is it that someone uh, can get a lesser sentence for cocaine or heroin, which are definitely harsher drugs, more addictive, um, you know, highly addictive. and di- Psychedelics disrupt- are not addictive. A- exactly. And so, th- but what I'm saying is the psychedelics make you an individual. They make you a free thinker and they connect you to the earth. And you also, the perspective changes. You know, Radically. the reason why, yeah, the reason why the governments of the world don't want that to be introduced is because it would l- radically shake the system up. People would realize who the true enemy is. People would realize what was really going on, the agendas, and they would also be able to be more in tune with the earth, which would change everything, you know? And so that that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I was having a conversation with someone. I'm, you know, I'm a musician, but I, I love. Um, I'm a free thinker. That's what I would say. A amen, truth seeker, amen. right? Oh. <laughs> right. And um, but this conversation was about AI, and my friend was saying, "Hey, uh, AI is going to be a great thing." And I said, "Well," uh, and so they started talking about uh, all the truckers who are about to lose their job in the next two to five years with the automated truck driving, you know, delivery service, right? And so he, they were like, uh, what's going to happen? This other guy says, uh, we're going to do uh, universal, uh, you know, everyone's going to have a universal income. It's going to be great. Ha! We're going to be able to do spiritually things. And so I said, 
guys, I don't think uh, universal income is great. And they said, why? And I said, imagine, if you will, one source having complete control over the payment system of all people. So meaning that you step out of line, you say something wrong, you don't agree. Oh, you mean the vaccine the passport? Exactly, exactly. And so you're turned off. You know, they can cut your now. Now they're in charge of your income. They can cut off your income. They can cut off. You know, and I said it's a form of control. Everything that's being established now is being sold to you as a luxury, as a um, um, as to make a your life easier convenience. Yeah, as a convenience, right? And so I said, I want you to go back to the tech bubble. And I want you to think about how all these things that have now corrupted the world were sold as a convenience, okay, in the beginning. So they're going to tell you that they're going to take these medial tasks away and that everything's going to be better. You're going to have all this time to focus on spiritual pursuits, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what the agenda is, guys. I was like, the agenda is going to be for control. And the reason why I'm not trying to sound like Debbie Downer or conspiracy theorists it's this is the first step this is the the awakening of of realizing that all of these things that are being rolled out are a form of control helps you to stand back and look at a different perspective and i said you don't have to believe me just ponder what if what if i am telling the truth i want you to actually think for yourself not in the narrative not in the propaganda but the true form of thinking for yourself intuitively feeling into it and learning uh this has not got my best interest in mind. Okay, what's the next step, right? What's the next step of unplugging from this narrative? Um, and I think that <clears throat> sound healing, meditation, breath work, breath work, you know, is such a powerful tool. And I think that these, once you unplug from that notion that all these people have your best interest in mind and you're giving all that power away, the next step is these exercises and the further unplugging you know, disconnecting from that. And then I feel like then there's that clarity of like moving to the next step. Well, what blows my mind is the same people you're talking about that think that this is great and we're going to have all these freedoms don't realize these are the same people that have stolen and killed the inventors of free energy technologies, treatments for cancer. They're the ones that fund the war. They're the ones that are behind the CIA, CIA's you know, training of people like Osama bin Laden and terrorists. They're the ones that have destroyed nature. And one of their claims is that the Great Reset is to protect nature. I'm like, you got to be out of your freaking mind. If you think these guys have any desire to do anything except absolutely strip mine this planet. And isn't it interesting that they're so busy building fucking rockets that only a handful of them can get out of here with and space stations and secret space programs while they're strip mining this planet. It's unbelievable to me that people have become so absolutely hypnotized that as you've alluded to, they have lost any capacity for critical thinking and thinking outside of the box. It's as though they're, the, they're, the, a huge percentage of the population has already been zombified. And it's, it's, it shocks me to think what's going to happen when they push this whole thing through. But as you and I have both agreed uh, prior to going live, over our dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I, I can't get in line with it. Yeah. No, I've got 37 years experience as a holistic health practitioner, a therapist, helping people all over this globe, working with movie stars and the greatest athletes in the world. I've got a massive library right next to me, at least a half a million dollars worth of books, if not more. I've studied my entire life and every single fiber of consciousness in my whole being says what's going on right now is the most dangerous thing that ever freaking happened to this planet. In fact, I honestly ponder whether or not we're being taken over by a, a alien ET race that has nothing but an interest in the minerals and the gems and the resources of this planet and just wants to trash it and go yeah hi everybody i know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin c there is a mountain of research on it but not all c is created equally i love paleo valley's essential c complex because it is the real deal bioavailable and i wanted you to hear right from autumn smith 
founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn, and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. So to get access to this complex, all you have to do is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15 at checkout. That's lowercase c-h-e-k 15 and you can save 15% off. I think storytelling is a powerful uh, form of um, conscious uh, breadcrumbs, right? Storytelling. So there, are you familiar with the TV show Fringe? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So season two of, of Fringe, I highly recommend season two, specifically season two of Fringe. It's uh, the whole season. Um, it's very interesting you know, uh, very, very interesting. So that's the older guy with kind of a, a deep voice and he's kind of a mad scientist. Walter, Walter, Walter. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a (laughs) few episodes. It's quite entertaining. It's quite good. And there's some good deep underlying plots going on in there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Walter Bishop's probably one of my favorite characters ever made for TV. I think he's gene. It's a genius. Whoever wrote that, 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 uh, that, uh, JJ Abrams, I guess did that. Yeah, there's some, you know, it's amazing how much truth there is hidden in movies, but it's also just as true that movies are a very big part of their brainwashing campaign. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's a lot (laughs) coming out now about, you know, there's been a number of actors speaking out about how China's got complete stranglehold on Hollywood. Well, that's the problem when you put everything up for sale, you have no control over who owns it, you know? Do you know in China, you can't own, you can't own anything unless you are, uh, you know, a member, you know, a, a uh, citizen, you know, if you're not a citizen and you, it, there's certain areas where they won't sell anything unless you're a citizen. And I think that there's uh, so much in our country that could be changed, you know, uh, you know, to, to accommodate for protection <laughs> of <laughs> yeah. the country. Um, and I, do, I just don't see it. It's sold to the highest bidder. And so that's why we're where we're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we have to take our country back. We've got to take back the soul of this, not only this nation, but this is a worldwide issue at this point. This isn't even, you know, this is this is this is a, a third world war being fought invisibly, and it's a few elite people against the entire freaking planet. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, Ian, as a man that's been. Uh, traveling the world for a long time and spending time and teaching in gyms. It's always amazed me to hear the kind of music both played in gyms and listened to by a lot of people in gyms, particularly the muscle heads, a lot of very chaotic head banging, heavy metal music, and what I call bad rap music about killing the world and hating this and hating that and fuck this and fuck that. Um, I find that uh, that that kind of music is very weakening to me and discordant in my soul. It stresses me to the core of my being. And when many of my students ask me why it is that people play that kind of music in the gym, and I suggest to them that they're actually using the music as a homeopathic, and I explain the laws of similars, and that they're actually choosing music that's mirroring their inner state And just like you have the double slit experiment where you get particles and waves and the waves can cancel each other out, that's what the law of similar says. I think that they're actually using this garbage music as a homeopathic to knock out the same level of crap inside of them, which, because I've talked to many of them, even my own students, and why do you listen to that shit? And you know what they (laughs) say? The most common thing? It calms me down. Yeah. Yeah. But to me, it just makes me feel like I'm being ripped apart by a meat shredder. So 
I'm just curious as a musician and a healer, what is your take on that? Yeah. Well, I think that <clears throat> sound healing uh, across the board, uh, you have some frequencies that will connect with with a lot of people. But I think saying like one of the things that I always kind of laugh at is like 98% of the people that listened to this track found that they were more peaceful. And I, you know, my question to those studies is how many people going into this study already liked classical music? Right. That's the first question, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so you picked a hundred people and out of those hundred people, like, you know, 78, 90 of them were like, you know, a high, I'm just saying a high number of them already liked classical. So then, you know, how much of that, fo you know, uh, factored into your study and then how many were kind of moved, you know, they didn't like it, but they kind of were moved. And these were questions that I would ask, you know, people that we're working with on a personal level. So my point is, is that uh, one man's ceiling is another man's floor, right? And so, you know, it's it's very it's it has to do with vibrational state, but it's also preferences of uh, music. Someone asked me the other day, do you ever listen to heavy music? And I said, you know, sometimes I listen to Rage Against the Machine or Tool. But I said, you know, when I was younger, I could listen to that stuff and appreciate it and be into it. Now I'm kind of looking at it as an artist and I say, oh, this is well recorded or I like what they did here, but it's not something I listen to on a everyday basis. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just, it's shifted. I want my vibration to stay um, Coherent. high. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so I still appreciate different music. I mean, I listen to Led Zeppelin or John Prine or, you know, James Taylor or the Beatles, you know, from time to time. But most of the stuff I listen to is more vibrational music and more of the the music that we're creating or, or working in those states. Um, it's just a different, you get to a point where you evolve to a different state and you still appreciate those things. But I think that people that are relying on this music uh, as a crutch and um, haven't explored the other things that, you know, are out there now, um, there's been huge expansion uh, in the offering of music that is in you know, frequency based or binaural based. And, um, I think it's worth investigating because, uh, like we said, the, the conspiracy of the tuning, the conspiracy of the, uh, subliminal messaging in Hollywood, as well as the mainstream music. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you this recently, I had a younger person tell me, you know, do you listen to any music that's made today? Like, you know, newer stuff, newer generation stuff. And I said, no, nah, uh, you know, a couple things here and there. But they were, you know, challenging me, like, there's some good music out there. Check it out. So I started exploring some stuff off of uh, iTunes and Spotify. And I immediately noticed, uh, after listening about two days to this stuff and just kind of exploring it, I felt uh, very depressed. I felt very um, out of sorts, you know, with, and immediately I stopped listening to the music and went back to my regular you know, music that I listened to. And I found that almost instantaneously, I could feel the difference of these two musics, you know, the, the pop music that's being put out today. And I don't think, I don't even know, like, I, I'll say this, what, you know, I know this probably sounds crazy, but I don't even know if the artists um, truly know what their music's being embedded with, meaning that when they record in the studio, that's kind of out of their hands now. And then it goes to the mixing and mastering and it goes to, you know, and it's like, it's like the subliminal messaging put in Hollywood movies and, and all of the things like that we were talking about before. I think, um, is it happening on, on every level? I don't think so, but is it happening at the highest level? I 100% agree that they're going, those infusion processes are taking place on what they will see is reaching the masses you know well, there's a there's a very good book about exactly that are you familiar with the uh bass guitarist victor wooten yeah i love victor wooten well his first book was um the music lesson which was excellent and his newest book is the spirit of music and that's exactly what the whole book's about is how the music producers using electronic manipulation have completely stolen the spirit of music. And he is talking about how music is dying and how we're killing the soul of music and what it's doing to us as people and how deeply concerned he is that music is basically being hijacked and crucified through 
manipulation by computers and and uh, sound engineers that are. And he also talks about how people don't realize that most of the so-called musicians that are on the charts today can't sing or or make music. It's all just all done in the studio, and it's not even there's no talent involved anymore. Right. Yeah. I we, I had a conversation about this. I was t- saying uh, James Taylor. You know. Uh, you know, someone like that, they write a song, uh, they write it from their heart. It's an outpouring of creative, you know, uh, and then if it hits with the masses, it hits with the masses, right? Then it's like, it's something that resonates with people. Now, Taylor Swift or someone goes into the studio and there's five music producers that are telling her what she needs to do to have the most successful song. Um, and the focus is just, you know, and I'm, I'm just using Taylor Swift. I'm not trying to single anyone out. I'm just saying a popular artist, you know, let's just blank blank here. Um, you know, and you look at the credits and it's like a lot of the stuff, uh, most of the time it's not even songs they wrote. They're just performing it and their producers are telling them what they need to do and how to shape their image and the chord progressions. And, and, you know, all, they have all these different musicians that are, you know, like you said, sculpting behind the scenes. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's insane. It really is. It's not about making heartfelt music. And I think that's another thing with what Victor Wooten was saying is that, the soul, the heart, the passion is gone. You know, it's about making money and entertaining. It's, it's not. All, it's all based on algorithms. Yeah, I'll I'll say this. I'll say I just want to say this. You you absolutely have to you personally. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm saying that you got to see this film. It's called The Mindscape of Alan Moore. The Mindscape of Alan Moore, and it will blow your mind. It's an amazing documentary. He, uh, this is a writer and a um, artist that did uh, the Watchmen, V for Vendetta, a bunch of the, you know, oh, yeah. if you've uh-huh. ever, yeah. So, so, but he talks about the power of creativity, and he talks about how it's been dumbed down to these mindless forms of entertainment, and you, everything that we're talking about. You, you just have to watch that documentary. It'll blow your mind. It's how do you so spell good. his last name? M O O R E. Okay, good. I'm going to check it out for sure. Ian, uh, your music with binaural beats for meditation and probably uh, you use music with binaural beats and medi- uh, for meditation and probably other applications. Could you explain how binaural beat music is different than other music and how binaural beats actually work? Yeah. Yeah. So binaural beats, I really believe, give the brain and heart <clears throat> a foundation, you know, a, a structure to kind of ground to. Um, and what happens is binaural beat, uh, has this really interesting, uh, phenomenon that happens when you take a, uh, frequency in the left ear and then put a different Hertz. Like, so let's say in the left ear, we put a hundred Hertz and in the right ear, we put 104 Hertz. And so what, what ends up happening is this interesting wobble, you know, depending, and the wobble becomes more prevalent depending on the power, the amplitude you know, that you're giving it. And so, um, you get this wobble sensation, you know, if you've ever heard a binaural beat by itself, it'll just go, whoa, 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 you know, kind of a wobble, uh, effect. And so what ends up happening is the brain does not like this disorder. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so it, le- what it does is it, the hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres synchronize. And in that synchronization, the brain hears one tone, right? Right. And so that one tone uh, will be the difference between the left and the right speaker. So if I did 100 and 104, it's going to pull in that one frequency and it's going to actually um, mimic four hertz is what the brain activity, the brainwave pattern is going to step down. So four to eight hertz, you're dealing with theta pattern, right? Right. So you're stepping the brainwave patterns down into a theta pattern. And what happens is in that step down, the body the nervous system then relaxes a little bit, lets go a little bit because the theta pattern is what you hit just before REM sleep. Right. Right. So that brainwave state is very conducive for kind of like that twilight, you know, um, very relaxed meditation, things like that. Out of Um, body travel. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then what ends up happening is ultimately the heart rate lowers. You'll feel the heart rate drop and it'll, it'll drop a little bit and people will, kind of sink into that, drop into that relaxed feeling. So that 
phenomenon happens uh, with headphones. So what's different about binaural beats is that you definitely need headphones for them to be effective as, as they can be. Um, and then the other side is that it actually synchronizes the hemispheres of the brain in a way that, you know, traditional music can't really uh, do, you know, which is critical today because so many people are trapped in their left brain hemisphere. It's incredible. Yeah. Which is linked to high cortisol levels, stress levels. Mm hmm. So, so really, um, our, the music that we're creating is, uh, you know, 90% of it is, in, is utilizing binaural beat technology. Um, you know, we, uh, I, the thing that I believe personally, that's a little different is that binaural beats need to be customized for the individual, meaning that, meaning that, uh, one size fits all in a binaural beat is very hard to accommodate everyone. Um, you know, certain people need different amplitudes, people, you know, depending on what level they are. Some people will say, well, binaural beats used to work for me, but now they don't anymore. And I said, they still do. You just have grown. You need to grow. You need binaural beats that grow with you. Right. Right. I and heard so, that comment. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's just, it's really interesting. Um, but I think it's a very, very powerful tool and it is definitely different than traditional music for sure. Yeah, it's great to know. And I, I love that you mentioned the adaptation because I, until you mentioned, I forgot because I've had several students come to me and say, how come this music that used to help take me into meditation isn't working anymore? And I, I simply said to them, well, maybe you, you've just become so accustomed to it that it's like eating the same food all the time. And that's a, a thought that came to me earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt you. And that's, you know, you talk about the color palette and the sound palette. We, I think we, we we're, as an artist, you know, we need a variety of colors uh, to really have a spectrum to create, um, to express ourselves fully, but also to, to really tap in. Like as I do healing oracles for people as part of my work. So I tap into their soul and, and ask their soul for an image to paint. And then the soul guides the selection of all the colors and everything that I put into it. But I can't do that with, you know, just three or four colors. I need, you know, I've, my, I've got tons of paint in there. I mean, it's just like my kids go in there and have a heyday, you know. And um, I think one of the things that with, that's going on with all the changes in music we've talked about, the, uh, the changes of media and movies, is it's narrowing people's um, palette on every level down. And just the way... If you know, I found a research study one time that was quite shocking. This was years ago. I was doing some research when I was writing my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And I just happened to have this question How many foods does the average person eat in their lifetime? So I searched it and found a research paper that showed that the average person for their entire lifetime only eats 10 to 12 foods. Wow. Well, when there's 350,000 edible plants and about a million animal species on the planet, that's a dangerously low palate. And so then I was doing research and I thought, I wonder if there's any research on how many exercises the average person does or knows. And lo and behold, I found a research paper that looked into how many exercises. If you walk up to somebody on the street and say, show me all the exercises you know, they showed the average person only knows or does 10 to 12 exercises their entire life. And I like, look at that. Two completely separate studies showed we're eating 10 to 12 foods and we only know 10 to 12 exercises. And I've got a software program that I created with uh, one of my buddies in Czech professional, Gary Crozier. I think we have 2,000 different exercises on our video library. Wow. And so- when we're looking at this dangerous collapse of the palate, we're turning into sort of a monochromatic organism, which is really very zombie-like. Yeah. And it's a form of control, you know? Totally. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know who I love? It, uh, when I say this, it blows people away because they look at the music that I make and they're like, they're, they're like, you listen to him? And I'm like, of course. And so Frank Zappa. Oh, Frank, yeah, yeah. So I love Frank Zappa because you know, like one of his famous sayings is the mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I think that when you look at his music, it like whether you liked it or not, it challenged you. 
right? Yes. It challenged you to to meet him where he was, not him meeting you where you are, right? Yes. And uh, and in that, he he asked you to look at what the potentiality could be with music, right? And you look at the diversity, like he did orchestral music. I mean, his guitar solos were absolute. Like there's a song called uh, Easter Egg, um, Watermelon and Easter Grass, I think is the name of it. And it's like a seven, eight minute song. It's all focused on the guitar. It's basically just a big guitar solo, but it's masterful, right? And I heard somebody, I think it was Steve Vai said, because, you know, Stevie Vai, the guitar player played in his band as a backup you know, musician for a while. And uh, I think it was Stevie Vai that said that he would write down the notation on on sheet paper, on, you know, sheet music before he even touched the guitar. He would hear the song, he would write out the song, and then he would write his guitar solo out before he even touched his guitar. He didn't just figure it out, you know, writing it. Um, and so he was a genius, a musical mastermind. There's several people who say that some of his pieces can't be played. Like um, even like orchestrals that, you know, orchestras that came in to work on his pieces, he would make them practice for a month to play his music. Right. Because they would come in and try to play it. And he'd be like, that's not right. You're you're out of time. You're not, you know, and people would say that he was a perfectionist, but it was that the people you're talking about professional musicians that couldn't play his stuff. But the, the main the main focus is he was a genius and he challenged you as a listener. And I think we have lost all challenges. Everything is predictable. Everything's cookie cutter. Everything is lost its uniqueness. You know what I'm saying? And that's what censorship's all about. Right. It's killing. It's killing free thinking. I tell people, you don't realize censorship amongst the human population is like monocrop farming. It kills the environment and diversity equals stability. Exactly. You know, when you stop people from expressing themselves you actually lose your capacity to see different viewpoints. And you also lose something else that's very dangerous because free speech allows the nutcases to go public. So when people start talking about shooting people and doing crazy shit, we all get the warning to keep our eye out for this person. But once you start censoring, and it turns out that the only people that are allowed to determine what is said are the psychopaths at the top of the food chain, then what you have is is an extremely dangerous situation that nowhere in nature creates stability nor survivability. But back to Frank Zappa. <laughs> Never go where the huskies go. <laughs> Don't eat that yellow snow. Watch out for the doggy do ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was he was definitely a character, but man, just genius music. And you know something I didn't know was uh the guys from Imagine You and Me and Me and you know the uh uh Turtles that they that they were singing with him. I didn't realize that those were the guys that he had a majority of the time singing on his uh his records, which was really interesting that they you know had that song, like, you know, the Turtles, the, that kind of music, and then started playing with Frank Zappa. That's just so wild to me. <laughs> you well, know? you know what that shows is diversity and open-mindedness and a willing to explore new things. I mean, yeah, our whole education system is really about teaching people what to think it has nothing to do with learning how to think. I left school and then I finished the ninth grade and I said, that's it. I can't get my questions answered. They're not teaching me a damn thing that I can see is going to help me make a living or be a productive citizen in the world. And it was the greatest thing I ever did. I educated myself by traveling the world and finding the smartest people that had knowledge on any of the things I knew I needed to learn to help people. And that's how I built my whole institute is by taking all these geniuses, practicing their material, synthesizing it down and putting it into an integrated system. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to announce that one of my favorite companies in the world, Bioptimizers, has a brand new amazing product called Blood Sugar Breakthrough. And boy, is that needed. Wade, I wanted you to come on and tell us how your new product works. Well, basically, we've combined a wide variety of products that help manage blood sugar and help dispose glucose into your muscle tissues as opposed into your fat tissues. And basically, by improving your insulin sensitivity and depositing sugar in a way that enhances your health, you will be able to have better workouts, better lean body mass gains, 
get leaner more easy and have that more steady blood sugar rate without the rises and dips, which is associated with, you know, blood sugar, poor management. That's excellent. What's the discount for Living 4D listeners and where do they get it? Well, if you go to bloodsugarbreakthrough.health slash living 4D and put in Paul 10, you'll get a 10% discount. And if it doesn't impress you better than any other blood sugar product you've ever tried, you get 100% of your money back. Hey, that's a no risk purchase for an amazing product. And believe me, my track record with Bioptimizer's products is 100% satisfaction. Never had anybody complain to me and I highly doubt you will, but I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you, Wade. I'm excited about the new product. And for a limited time, Bioptimizer's is also giving away free bottles of their best-selling products, P3OM and Masszymes with select purchases. What is your journey and where will you go? You know, you have a lot of music on your site. I would love it if you can just give us an overview of what you offer there so that people can kind of get a sense of, wow, that might be for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. So we have like three vehicles, basically. The first vehicle is, um, you know, a, it's our membership program, our affiliate program. I think there's 90 albums that are in that discography that are available to the affiliates. Um, and that is, you know, a membership program. The second avenue is the wellness program, which is for sale for home use, uh, um, for individuals to purchase and to, um, you know, utilize in their self-care practice at home. So I, there's several albums in there. I can't remember the number we have, but, but a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's I a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, um, albums for, uh, pain management for pain relief. We've got for anxiety, the way that the albums are set up are that they're the targeted focus playlist basically that people can buy. Um, we have chakra tune up album one and two. We've got uh, movement meditation one and two shamanic journey one and two. We've got, um, uh, we just recently put out two new albums. One's called Focus Driven that people utilize at work, you know, put on in the background while they're, you know, accomplishing tasks and just keeps them moving. Uh, we have another one called Releasing Trauma that just came out. Um, so we've even got one that's called um, uh, Manifesting Your Divine Partner. Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of albums with the Focus uh, playlist on the Wellness album. And then we also have a Binaural Beat uh, album as well that uh, focuses on theta pattern binaural beats that people use a lot for healing and for moving stagnant energy in the body. And all that can be found on listening to smile.com in the store section. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it, it's uh, those of you listening, when you go to the store section, it looks like there's only three CDs there. Three, there's only, it looks like three album covers, but you click on those are all the headings for all the music under that section. So you click on that particular uh, image if you want healing music or the different classes, and then you'll see there's a lot hiding behind those covers. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about your affiliate program, because a lot of my listeners are healthcare professionals. And um, we're going to 
as they've probably already heard, we're putting some of your music right into the podcast so they can benefit from it, experience it. Um, can you give us an overview of how your affiliate program works so that any of the healthcare professionals that would like to take advantage of that, make your music available, but also get a commission on it, can, can understand the basics of that? Yeah. So uh, most practitioners, uh, you know, I'm going to say this and be daring, but most practitioners are utilizing music in their practice already, but they're breaking copyright laws, right? Mm -hmm. So what that means is, is using music in a commercial setting when you're taking money from a client uh, and you're utilizing someone else's IP intellectual property in your practice uh, without permission, you're breaking copyright law of that individual's intellectual property rights, right? So um, there are licensing opportunities that you can do through Spotify and other places um, where you can pay monthly fees or yearly annual fees to have the permission to use the music. So what we wanted to do was, there's two things going on here. One is the, the streaming services and record labels are not set up to support in any way, shape, or fashion uh, a, a relationship with artists. There's just nothing in there for the artist to be sustainable. It's everything set up for the tech platforms and for the record labels to be sustainable over the artist, which is the essential backbone of what the industry's found on, you know? <laughs> um, yes. It's, so, it's, uh, having watched countless documentaries of, of the lives of famous musicians, if there's one reoccurring theme, it's musicians getting ripped off by music producing companies. Right. And now the streaming services even further that. Um, so what I mean by that is the average employee at Spotify, uh, not upper echelon, not management. The average employee makes over $100,000 a year at Spotify, but they tell the artists that they can't pay them royalties, right? Oh, <laughs> like, yeah, right. So um, the thing that's interesting is you have to have a million streams on Spotify to make 3000 us dollars. Oh my and, God. And it's ridiculous. So, uh, so what we did was we said, I started having conversations with my friends who were holistic practitioners. And I said, if you could utilize music in any way, what would you want? What, what, what are your needs? And so I started having that conversation with lots of people and I saw that they wanted it for podcasts, for online on hold music. They wanted it to play in the background at their shops. They wanted to use it in sessions. They wanted to be able to resell it at their yoga studios. So I just started making notes and I said, okay, let's do all this. Let's create a multi-level license, a multi-use license that grants you all of these permissions, right? And I said, now I need you to support the artist, the, the artistry, the artists and musicians. So I'm going to assign a $60 a month value and we're going to give you training on how to host these events that we call sonic meditations. Even if you're not a sound healer, even if you're not a musician, we'll teach you how to host these frequency-based events. Um, we will give you resale permissions. We'll give you all the permissions that you guys have asked for, but we're asking in return the $60 uh, a month you know, value. So then we said, how about this? If you um, sell these albums, you'll get a cut of every sale. And then if some other practitioners come to your studio or practice and say, man, I love this music. I want to work with it then we're going to give you a hundred dollar finders fee for every person that signs up. And we're going to call those gratitude payments. And so it's amazing. Yeah. So we wanted to, to create a win-win scenario where everyone was getting something. They were getting tools, they were getting value, they were getting extra revenue streams. Um, and so that's what we did is we reverse engineered the program to be what the needs were and then to how to meet those and how to make everyone feel honored in that, 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 uh, interaction. So, the, the last thing is, is that when they sign up, they get two free albums when they sign up. Plus, they get an album every month and the albums are created in the astrology and the current events. So they have something to work with that's fresh. They don't have to search things. They don't have to, you know, get on other platforms. Everything's downloaded. They, they get the uh, astrology download. They get the frequencies and the intentions of the music where they can share it with their community. So complete transparency you know, on everything that's behind the curtain um, and just basically sets it up so that they can utilize and be protected. No one can tell them they're getting fined for using our music because they have a direct license from us to do so. Yeah, that's what I call sharing the love. I tell everybody love is a boomerang. Whatever you put out comes back. So 
if you, we take care of the artists, they take care of us. You know, it's so many great musicians and artists can barely survive, but they give their heart and soul to the world and then get ripped off by the evil geniuses uh, that, uh, well, I don't need to expand. Anybody that's been listening to us already knows. I noticed that you have a course uh, or certification did I get that right? Looking at your website, some kind of like for using healing music. Can you give us a little snapshot on that? Yeah. Yeah. Use it for. Yeah. So for the last few years, uh, Dana and I, the co-founder have, we've been doing what we call personal frequency coaching sessions. Um, and so those, what we do is, uh, sound healing is the new fad. So many people are curious about it, but just ultimately don't have any real information and want to get started. Right. So the coaching sessions really help people to get acclimated and they can do it through zoom. They can do it at home. So during COVID, this was a huge deal. People were having hard times and wanted to buy music and wanted to have help on how to use it. Am I using it right? What do I do now? And so you're explaining all this, right? So what we, so many of our affiliates were saying, I want to do what you you guys are doing, you know, and so we came up with a certification on how and why uh, this is effective. And then basically, it's something that they can do from their, their, their home and zoom, you know, on the internet and really reach a lot of clients, especially during, you know, lockdowns and different things that went on this past year. But it also adds another revenue stream for like yoga teachers, um, and other practitioners that can utilize music, you know, and it's just, a, it's, it, it adds another uh, value to the tool belt, you know, for their, for their modalities. So is the course teaching them how to select pre-composed music or how to compose music for individuals? So um, it's teaching them, basically the program comes with three discs, right? So it's three CDs, a body, organ frequencies, uh, planetary frequencies, and then chakra frequencies. And so they're able to then learn and become knowledgeable about how to improvisationally, you know, work with someone and find intuitively, uh, and, and, um, based on the personal preference of the individual selecting the right music for them to work with and then accommodating, uh, that, I mean, um, uh, in tandem putting together the, uh, breath work, the mantras and the intention setting that is necessary to kind of aid the music and the, the movement of that stagnant energy of the individual. Excellent. What a, what a great offering and what a, what a, a great way for a person to expand their practice as a therapist or a healer and do something that's very powerful, but really, um, not only helps them make more money, but customize their program to each individual's needs. I think it's absolutely an uh, excellent idea, and I'm really grateful that you're doing that. Ian, are there any closing comments you'd like to share, and uh, is there any specific offer for Living 4D listeners for your music uh, and anything else you'd like to offer? Yeah, so on our website, <clears throat> there is a, at the top of the uh, page, you'll see a services, and under that tab of services, there is a meditation affiliate. So anyone that wants to, as a practitioner that wants to work with the music can sign up there and they'll get a reduced price using the code LIVING4D. Um, and so when they put that code in, uh, it will um, let us know that they're coming from your community, which will give them a, a reduced price. So the typical price of the program is seven twenty for the year, and that comes with a full year of support. You know, email and phone. They get the training, and then they get all of the rights and privileges to utilize the music and to resell the music. But so the price that we're offering through you guys is five hundred and fifty dollars. So it's a significant reduction. That's for a whole year. That's for a whole year. That's a damn good deal. Yeah, yeah. So and you've got such a huge. Uh, catalog of music. So is this just the three CDs or is this more? No. So for that 550 with your community, what they would get is 14 albums and they would get the support for the year to use those and the resale privileges for those for the year. That's amazing. I, I love that. Um, I think that's just an excellent offer and I'm ex so excited for you guys to go to Ian's website. Can you give us the website once again? Yeah. Listening to smile.com. I was just going to say, you, you can hear samples of most of the tracks, right? 
Yeah, there's a lot of tracks that you can listen to all the way through. Um, I think if once you listen to it two or three times, it'll say now it's time to purchase. But <laughs> but it lets you listen through most of the songs. I think uh, you know at least once or twice, uh, sometimes three times. While I was writing, I I started by just saying, oh, let me just listen to Ian's music while I put this together for Ian. <laughs> and then um, I got so busy writing, I, and all of a sudden I heard it shift and. I think it was must have been like you said looping or something and then it stopped and I said okay let me try something else so for the whole time I was doing this but like I said I was going after the uh, stress release and anxiety cuz <laughs> you know there's a lot of smoke in the air and it was too close for comfort man out here where I live yeah. I mean we get last summer we had 116 degree days I mean it's dry as out there you even think fire and you're going to kill everything Yeah yeah it's uh, but, it's I'm glad that you guys are okay. Yeah, the music helped me a lot. I'm like, wow, this is powerful, healing music. I was digging it. So what a great podcast. I've had such an amazing time and what an honest, loving conversation and a real look, not only at the science and the practice of music for healing and for living a better life, but what a great, honest exploration of what's going on in the world. And if you guys love this podcast like I did and realize the importance of what we're talking about, please share the podcast widely. Um, thank you to all my amazing sponsors for your beautiful companies and your sustainable practices. Thank you to all of you listeners that buy anything from the sponsors. A little commission goes to the podcast to help me have the time and the resources to put the podcast together and find amazing guests like Ian. And uh, I look forward to sharing much more with you soon. Ian, any closing comments? I'm just so thankful for being here. And I'm so thankful to have made a new friend, man. I really Me enjoyed too, it. man. Yeah. I yeah. found a soul, brother. <laughs> yep. And, you know, one last question, Ian, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow and someone put a microphone in front of you and said, Ian, what is your message for the world knowing you're leaving tomorrow? What would you say to the world right now, Ian? <laughs> I would say uh, the Tom Petty lyric, most of the things I worried about never happened anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. In other words, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, amazing podcast. Thank you to all of you. Lots of love. I'll talk to you soon with another exciting podcast. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Ian Morris. You can find Ian and his music on Instagram and Facebook at Listening to Smile. Visit Ian's website, listeningtosmile.com, for special Living 4D discounts off his music and programs using the promo code Living 4D. Save 40% off digital albums and $170 off their special affiliate music program for health and wellness professionals that includes support, training, and new music each month. Also available are personal frequency coaching sessions for your own customized sound healing experience. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chikiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.
sí, bueno, en todo. Hoy, sí, bueno, en todo. Are you ready?